Hello. Good morning. I'm James Harding. I'm the editor and a co-founder of Tortoise. And today's thinking, frankly, couldn't be more timely. It's an attempt to try and understand how businesses survive. Uh, and um, thanks to Mike Lynch's optimistic, promising uh, suggestion, even thrive in the course of this pandemic. Um, when we set up Tortoise and my co-founder Katie Vanek Smith and I started work on it more than you know about a couple of years ago but we launched last April we always said that we are pro-business not least because we are one and at this time when there's been so much coverage of what's happening on the health front that it's it's been the case that business particularly small and medium-sized businesses particularly startup businesses have struggled to make plain quite what an existential threat they're dealing with and so this morning it feels as though we're particularly lucky to have not just uh, Mike Lynch uh, a, a tech investor entrepreneur and one of the founders of the most successful British tech businesses ever uh, come and join us but a bunch of others I'm going to come to through the course of the coming hour to try and help us understand you know in really sort of practical and granular ways how we deal with the extraordinary economic crisis that we're facing. Um, this week, as you may have seen, the tortoise file is a massive effort at marking our own homework. It's an attempt to understand the extent to which the news media is or isn't rising to the challenge. One of the questions I think you hear increasingly is does the media understand what is happening in the economy, what's happening to businesses and what's happening to jobs? We hope in the next hour, we're gonna give ourselves some time to try and understand those things in detail. The immediate answer to the lockdown, the phasing out of it, and then an eye to the future. Um, I think pretty much everybody on this uh, Zoom call has probably done more Zoom calls in the last six weeks than they think is healthy. But just in case, uh, there are two really simple ways that everyone can get in touch. One is tab the, hit the uh, chat tab, let me know what you think. Uh, say, uh, give your point of view, I may very well come to you, feel the points that you're making uh, to uh, Mike or others uh, that are involved. Alternatively, as you'll see, there's a participants tab. And if you um, hit the participants tab at the bottom of that little screen, you'll see a gray box that says raise your hand and your blue digital hand comes up. And uh, sure enough, uh, it'll catch my eye and uh, I'll invite you to speak. Now, it may feel like a lifetime ago that we used to do think-ins in our newsroom and the principle there was it's like an open news meeting. It's intended to be a place where we all share what we think. So we've got a pretty simple rule which is no questions. We want to know what your experience is, what your point of view is. We want to be informed by the way in which you're seeing things. So weigh in and tell us what you, uh, what you think. Um, We've got, we've got an hour, we've got some time. As I said, we're going to try and look at business in some detail, uh, but please feel free to weigh in and, and address the things that you think need to be, need to be addressed. Um, and with that, Mike, I'm going to turn to you, if I can, for, from the start. Um, Mike, I suppose it's very difficult to think about things without having a sort of base case for what's going to happen in the economy. What's yours? I actually don't tend to think like that. Um, one of the interesting cultural ideas we always have these days is the idea that you have to be right. You have to be able to predict something. And whoever gets the prediction was right. And whoever turns out that it didn't do that was wrong. Actually, when you're running a business, the most important thing is to hedge is to say, well, I think A is going to happen. But if B happens or C happens or D happens, this is how I'm covered. And the, the fascinating thing about the whole virus is that it's really brought us back to a world where no one actually knows what's going to happen. Uh, and so if you're in the job of running a business and planning for it, you can certainly have your most likely case. But the real art form is, is about how you hedge, how you say, if I assume case A, this is how I'm going to deal with it. If I do case B, this is how I'm going to deal with it. And then uh, you put into place the different aspects of, of what you need to be covered on those more likely scenarios. So I actually push back on this idea. You know, I once years ago had a finance director who told me what the dollar was going to do. 
I turned around to him and I said, well, if you know what the dollar's going to do, why are we in business? We're just speculating. <laughs> um, and of course, a real business is about hedging for what the dollar can do. And that's the same situation you're in here now. So, so by so, all means, make your best case, but it, the art form of running a business is to handle a, a, a different set of scenarios. So, so, so Mike, uh, I understand that. When I was at the FT, um, I remember being told as a financial, young financial times reporter, never ever call the markets, and uh, it seems like a the right thing to do. I suppose, I suppose, though, you don't need to be much of an investor reporter to be witnessing the scale of job cuts that are happening at a place like British Airways, 12,000 jobs going. We're seeing them in big industrial conglomerates, things like GE. You're beginning to see the, the huge companies making a call on a much tougher economic environment, not just for the next three to six months, but for the next two to three years. And so I suppose that raises the first question, which is if you are running a small startup business, you've got big ambitions, what should you do next on costs? Well, the first problem, I think, when you're running a small startup business is by definition, you're an optimist. Uh, you wouldn't be doing it unless you didn't believe that you had something and you were going to be successful. So the first problem you see with um, startups, generally high growth companies, is denial. Um, so there's actually um, an unwillingness to face that it's different. And of course, I lived through the dot-com uh, boom and bust and, you know, I can remember in the run into that, everyone, it's different now. The rules are different. It's going to be different. We're going to be fine. And uh, yes, the, the scenario um, looked like they're going to be pretty bleak. And so if you're in one of those, those company situations, you have to understand this is serious. It is a matter of survival. It's about getting to the other side. You know, if we were to use a nature analogy, it's like being in the Arctic tundra. Uh, how do I survive until spring comes? And, uh, and that, a lot of that's got to come down to cash and costs. And the fascinating thing about that is changing your mindset to stop thinking about all the wonderful things you're going to do and the way in which you're going to take over the world and your plan for world domination and all those sort of things. Your goal now is to get through winter because if you get through winter, actually spring, when this is all over, there can be great opportunities. One of the fascinating things is companies pick up a lot of uh, things they're doing they don't need to do and one of the, the great realities of human endeavor is it's actually really hard to stop things yeah so the first thing to do is look around in the company and say what do we actually need if we were in survival mode if we're getting through winter here which things are we doing now in a large company that will lead to some of the decisions we're seeing in the news where you know, divisions or approaches or you know ba is talking about gatwick now you have a big advantage in a smaller company in that you can disassociate the people from what they're doing. Yeah. So for example, you might have great people working on a particular project. You want to keep those people, but that project might not be one for winter. Um, and so what we can actually do in a smaller business is, is look after the asset, which is the really good people, and perhaps put them onto something which is about getting through the next few months. So that first phase of, of, of denial um, means that you, you overcome that. You start to think, you know, I'm, there's an analogy I've always used when I talk about this idea with our portfolio companies is the hungry wolf. You know, the wolf may be a magnificent predator, but when the going gets tough, it will, you know, eat off anything it can get um, to survive. That's the mode you need to be in at the moment. Um, and that comes down to making sure that you are concentrating on what actually matters and you're concentrating on cash. And, 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 and Mike, what do you think about the sort of the ethical or even moral elements of this? Because one of the things that's very difficult now is I appreciate that people in business defend their behaviours, their practices, their systems for reasons of inertia. But there's also now a real moral element to this, which is if you look at the scale of the economic crisis we're going into, making the cuts that might be necessary for the business means that there are people who are not going to be supported going to a very, very tough and potentially long recession. How do you, how do you handle that? Well, in, in many businesses, for example, in tech, normally the actual asset is the people. Mm. That's the thing you're trying to protect. But you have to realize that in order to protect the people, sometimes you have to make very difficult decisions. Mm. 
And one of the things that I've always um, worked on the basis is that I don't really care what someone's role is. If they're a great contributor to what's going on and keeping the, the boat afloat, then you want to keep hold of those people. So you have to face the reality that there are going to be some people that you know, are not the ones which you should be let everyone else be carrying at a time like this. Um, not something you'll often hear business leaders say, but there are those realities. But the art form to do it ethically, I think, is to understand the people that have some level of resilience in the situation, try and do it in a way that as soon as you have some strength in the business, you can uh, help alleviate those problems. So you know, the furloughing approach is what the government's handing us to do some of those sort of things in that situation. And then also realize that you can't necessarily save everyone. And yeah. attempt to, for example, um, not lay off anyone in a business may well lead to everyone being um, losing their jobs. So it's a very unpalatable reality, but you do have to make um, decisions. And the thing I think you should do as a manager from an ethical point of view is make sure that you take time and care on those decisions. And in a smaller business, um, you should be able to do that on an individual basis without the sort of, you know, strokes of pens um, mm -hmm. and dealing with that sort of thing. Mike, I'm going to come to the the more sort of optimistic and hopeful in brackets element of this thinking, the how do businesses survive in a moment. But we've invited a number of other people who've got sort of great angles on this. Pippa Malgram from H Robotics, Tim Gordon from Best Practice AI, and Hugh Van Steenis, uh, who's a senior advisor at, H, uh, at UBS. I'd like to, if I can, actually come to Hugh first. Um, uh, Hugh was actually at our very, very first thinking uh, at the time he was advising the governor of the Bank of England. And um, Hugh, it's very nice to see you. Hugh, can you, can you sort of just pick up where Mike left off? You know, where do you think we are in terms of the broader economy and its outlook? And in the, if you follow the chat, there's a really interesting conversation spurred by my colleague, Chris Cook, who's sort of moderating the conversation in text form about whether or not we're actually dealing with a liquidity crisis or something more profound in terms of a solvency crisis for so many businesses. Um, well, James, I think it's a, tough, it's a tough set of questions. So look, like Mike, I think that having scenario analysis at the heart of one's business is critical because we, we've got radical uncertainty. We simply don't know how this will play out. Uh, we can paint an optimistic scenario uh, that this is a one wave, uh, a, a moderately one wave disease, that the, uh, uh, the various programs the government have put in place will be supportive and we can have a, a rebound into, into uh, the second half and into next year. We can also have a very grisly scenario um, of uh, a very long and repeated uh, set of lockdowns. And so I think uh, using Mike's scenario thinking is really important. One thing I just add to that is I also would like to think with small businesses about the different phases. There's the crisis, there's recovery, and then there's kind of where we go next. Mm -hmm. And historically, and at least in quote ordinary recessions, m many small businesses actually fail in the recovery stage rather than actually in the crisis. And that's because they then say, aha, we've now got this window. We're going to launch this new product. We're going to go for it. And just simply, they, they take their current plans, push them to the right. And then as they put their foot on the accelerator, maybe their customers, their suppliers are not ready at the same rate. And that's when they hit the wall. So mm -hmm. I think it's also important to really think through that, the different phases of what you do in this cash conservation mode that Mike described to the recovery mode to, to coming out. Uh, I think, you know, uh, I think the, cent the um, in terms of liquidity solvency, I think it's a really tough one because they, they're, they're so uh, um, embedded with each other. I mean, just we haven't seen that the speed of the, of the deceleration of the economy. I think it's very tough to find anything quite like this. I mean, I think the best analogy, unfortunately, was the First World War, where, you know, within six days, the, the, the environment was so changed. And I think it's so multifaceted. Um, I think we have to accept this is going to be quite a grind. Um, you know, my central cases are that as we unlock, you know, things will come back, uh, you know, more slowly depending on the sector. But, you know, there are, you can already see if you, I mean, probably those of us on the, you know, Zoom today might have said they don't want to go on a cruise lining uh, trip. Actually, uh, orders for next year, uh, bookings for next year are actually up on this year, yeah. uh, surprisingly. And so there are, there are some quirks which, so I think, you know, this, com this comes down to we just have to be open and honest that we don't know. I think you, you need to make sure you've got your finances safe and secure. I was very worried for the UK audience that um, the small business team was really failing or had blockages. And so I was del uh, delighted that it's now opened up to this uh, 
a new sort of um, 100% guarantee. As of last night, 115,000 businesses applied. So it speaks to this kind of cash conservation. Uh, mm -hmm. My one encouragement is not to spend it up front. Um, I think if I'm thinking more sort of, you know, medium term, I think one theme which we should all talk about is the acceleration in the digital economy and what that means for different small businesses. Because that's, I think, going to be one theme which is likely in most scenarios. But Hugh, Hugh, can I just pick up on, or just on the point about the small business loans? Um, and, you know, we, we started off this conversation about survival. Um, you know, as I said, you were working in the Bank of England. You've been thinking quite a lot about public policy. Right? And I'm encouraged, too, by the fact that these bounce back loans have been put in place. It seems to me, though, the fact that 115,000 firms have applied for them is also a huge indictment of the coronavirus business interruption loan scheme, the main effort of the government, which said we are going to put £330 billion available to the banking system to back loans to you know, businesses. And I think just £4 billion so far has gone out the door. It seems as though that the, the, the main artery of funding and access to finance for business in the UK has been blocked. Why is that the case? Uh, look, I think it's a great point, James. Look, I, I was very, very critical of the of the of the original scheme. So, look, um, first, and why? Will you explain uh, what, what you thought the problem? Yeah, was? No, exactly. So, so, so let, let's take one step back. What do we learn? Like, this is like um, a hurricane. What do we learn from sort of hurricane and disaster relief? You need it speedy. You need it simple. And quite frankly, you need to de-risk it. So, you want something? Let's take in Switzerland or in the States. It's a two-page form. Um, it, it's done within twenty-four hours. And depending on the country, it's either 100% guaranteed, or in some countries like France, it's 90% guaranteed. But you need to de-risk it from the point of view of the, uh, the bank. Unfortunately, we made it uh, very slow because we used the British Business Bank. Just for the lenders, there was 33 pages of frequently asked questions. I mean, it's nuts. Oh um, it was taking uh, between two and six weeks. Um, you know, there's an element here that, you know, regulators need to slightly hold their noses. But, you know, do you know who the customer is? Are they uh, money good? Uh, do you have a business plan? In a, in a crisis, you need to just get on with it. Because, yeah. um, you know, as, as many of us on the call would know, you know, there's different reasons you need cash. Uh, but I would, I would suspect that many of these businesses who applied are ones who are, have no idea what's going to happen next, but probably have a couple of people holding back, paying their bills. And for want of three or four bills not getting paid, it would be a real shame for that business to be destroyed. And I suspect a lot of people applying uh, are, are in that camp. So it was too complex. The, the, uh, so my moving to 100% guarantee, the state's taking the risk, it de-risks it to the banks and you can shovel it through quickly. I think one area where I think we still have not yet fixed it um, is by leveraging the entire community. So at the moment, you can only apply for a bounce back loan through one of seven traditional banks. Yeah. And you know, some of them are a bit more techie than others, but let's be honest, they're rarely viewed as the single most techie firms in the system. Uh, pretty much every fintech is not included. Uh, I think the next tweak of this is to make sure you can leverage the entire community. And I think that's another lesson for public policy is, you know, the coordination by the government se policy sector of the private sector has been shown wanting. PPE, ventilators, what have you. We're not used to this you know, corralling the, the troops. And I think that, that what we've learned in the last six or seven weeks is we need to coordinate and leverage the entire system a whole lot better. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to sort of take that point, Hugh, and it, it, as we come to the second half of this, go back to thinking a little bit about how we're looking ahead. It feels to me at the moment, the way we're judging this crisis is asking questions about what, what didn't happen in February that should have done. And I think we're now in a position where we should be thinking about what do we need to do to save September and the second half of the year. So I'd like to think a little bit about what the government does and how it acts more nimbly from, from here on in. Um, but but uh, I'm, gonna, I'm going to, firstly, firstly, the one thing to say is if anyone w wants to weigh in, don't be shy. Just put your hand up. Uh, hit the participants tab, get your little blue digital hand up, I'll come to you. If you want to um, uh, arm wrestle uh, my uh, uh, colleague uh, Chris Cook in the chat, I'll bring you in that way too. But I'd like to come to uh, Dr. Pippa Malmgren because A, you, you've, you've got a, a business and an angle on that in the sort of robotics world. I'd love to understand that better. But also you've written about leadership in the 21st century, uh, picking up on what uh, Hugh just said, heaven knows this is a moment for it. So 
what's your view of actually how businesses and government can and should sustain just levels of employment right now? Uh, so I think the first thing to understand is the small businesses in the real economy are the second wave of triage that needs to happen. The first one were humans, patients, and hospitals. Mm. The second wave is going to be the economy. Mm. And, uh, and, you know, I've worked in public policy. I was the president's advisor when we had both Enron and 9-11. So, you know, one understands emergency situations and response, but I think what's, what's problematic here is it's not just that businesses have been blown away by these events, it's that our business models have been blown away by these events. Uh, and I think some of that may turn out to be a good thing. Like I'm in the world of making autonomous vehicles and drones. Uh, they're effectively prosthetics that allow a person to literally pick up a mobile phone and say, I want to see my mining site in Africa right now. And I want all the digital assets about that. I want to see my Brazilian agribusiness. So it lets you see where you couldn't see otherwise. It's an example of the incredible speedy digitization that's occurring as a result of the COVID crisis. So that's, that's fine. But what we're not recognizing is why do you think there weren't enough ventilators that would be because for 15 years the venture capital community took the view that hardware was not worth investing in and it was only software plays okay now we start to see that actually you need both for the yeah. economy to function well why is it that so many businesses had no cash on hand to deal with this unexpected unanticipated event answer because the analyst criticized any company that held on to cash for the last 15, 20 years, and, uh, and brutally so, uh, and punished them with a share price. So maybe this is a good thing, that these events are going to cause us to rethink what is a sound business model. And I, I think of it a little bit like in the world of Formula One racing, uh, there's a constant trade-off between resilience and efficiency. And they shave one gram of weight off that car every single day yeah. Yeah. and they never know is that the one gram that lets you win the race or is that the one gram that causes the car to completely break apart mm -hmm. and the answer is what we've done for the last 20 years is focus entirely on efficiency with no focus on resilience and this event is causing us to shift and that's a good thing so i'll, I'll finish just by saying this i think extraordinary new businesses and new business opportunities are going to come out of this moment in history. We're going to look back and many people will say, this was the thing that positively changed what I was doing. Mm. However, the loss along the way will be substantial. I, I think the policymakers, and again, having, having been one, I'm, I'm not trying to be critical, but it, this is not like the snooze button on an alarm where you can just say, let's wake the economy up in another month or two, and they'll all be there. They will not all be there. Yeah. And so this, I per think that as an economist, what I anticipate is people ask is we're going to have a, a W-shaped economy, a, a V-shaped economy, an L-shaped recovery. The, I think the recovery is literally quantum. It's like the 1920s. You will have simultaneously people living a great Gatsby life. They will be so delighted that they survived this and they will be in a position where they've got assets, the huge injection of capital into the economy will lift asset prices. Look at where the stock markets are already. You can see that there's upside there. And then there are people who have been thrown off. Uh, they've lost their foothold in the economy and they won't be able to reestablish it as they had it before. They're gonna yeah. have to come in in a new way. And so you can have the great Gatsby and you know Ulysses, yeah. the two novels both at once in the same period of history. And so I, I think it's hard to make generalizations, but I, I think that this is a moment where creative thinking by businesses will absolutely pay off. And I see new business models and new businesses coming to the fore. And I'll just say one in, as an example, it sounds so small, so insignificant. But the creation of this thing called cloud clubbing, where there was a DJ in Paris called Zouk who mm -hmm. had to cancel a concert because of COVID. And cleverly, he went, why don't I just hold this thing online? 
-hmm. And now this has become a global phenomena of rave parties, DJs playing online. It sounds like not a big deal. I suspect it's how people will find out about cool new music going forward, not radio anymore. So, huh. so we must be open to the idea that new ways of doing things are being created by the circumstances. Well, well uh, Pippa, it's really interesting to you say that. First, I'd just like to say, in because he's not nearly boastful enough, but your point about efficiency and resilience, actually it was my colleague Chris Cook wrote a piece called mm -hmm. Fragile States, which was about exactly this. The, the And it really, I felt found out by by it and by this debate, having, if you like, grown up in newsrooms and in a culture where it was all about efficiency and there wasn't, and, and capability looked like waste. Um, so um, if, if you haven't had a look at it and you're on the call, do have a look at Chris's piece. But, but also, Pippa, you've done this sort of curious thing. Often while people are speaking, I just check the chat to see whether or not anyone's made a point. Extraordinarily, while you were speaking, I also found there were two points that you'd made. So I don't know how you did that, but th there were two things in particular that I think are worth kind of just digging into. Your point that the banks aren't necessarily the best just distribution mechanism for getting money to businesses in distress, and the idea of a resolution trust court for the for the UK or, or other countries. Can you just explain what you mean by that? Sure. Well, having been a banker for many years myself, the bottom line is the banks cannot on lend that money because the credit conditions are deteriorating so fast. Uh, and let's face it, it's uh, government has announced things that fundamentally break uh, the underlying conditions, the sort of social contract environment where yeah. businesses normally live, like people don't have to pay mortgage, rent, or tax for a period of time. And while that's a blessing for many, it's also a real problem uh, for businesses because you can't depend on cash flows anymore. Government may intervene and stop them. Uh, so, so number one, you can't depend on the banks. And, and let's face it, the, the, British, um, the British Business Bank, I think the last time they were asked to extend money, it took them like 18 months before they cut the first check, yeah. right? Which is, as you say, it's just crazy. That doesn't work. The timing is off. Um, resolution trust, I think, is a really important idea to think about. So in the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s, when we had the savings and loan crisis in the United States, where many, many businesses, actually banks, went bust, but this meant businesses. And so what the US government did was to say, we'd rather preserve some goodwill and some enterprise value rather than having all of it drop to zero because the hit to the economy is so big. So we basically took all the broken assets and let's face it, one of the things COVID is doing is revealing, just like with a patient, it's revealing that the economy has lots of pre-existing conditions. Mm. And one of them is massive debt. And one of them is, is lack of capital. So you take these broken businesses, you put them in a structure, uh, you wrap it in government debt, and then you auction off the underlying real assets. Now in the 80s, 90s, it was easy because what you were selling were golf courses uh, yeah. and buildings and physical things. In this period of history, 70, 80% of the economy is services. So what are you selling? And so I think back to Hugh's point, in the tech world, what you're trying to do is preserve the networks, preserve where, where the human networks can produce value in future. And you'd rather have them drop to 50% than zero. And yeah. so to protect that goodwill, I think we should look at that resolution trust model, modify it for a services world. And basically you then sell those assets for five cents on the dollar or five pence on the pound and you provide the investment opportunity that every pension fund and every investor is looking for. I'll finish by saying the one thing I have to tell you I have found in this crisis is the investors are loaded with cash. The central banks have given them vastly more cash and they want to put it to work. So there is an openness to, to business models. They just need to be COVID proof and resilient uh, and so if you're, if you don't have that, you should rethink and maybe pull your people together in a different business structure that can appeal to that. Okay, Pippa, thank, thank you. Um, 
I'm going to come back to Mike in a moment on that because actually we get mixed messages, uh, honestly, about the extent to which investors are loaded with cash and the appetite for making investments, how cautious they are, Pippa. So I'd like to talk to Mike about that and sort of what the growth outlook is. Um, firstly, just to say, given that I'm looking on this call, quite a lot of people, either names I know because you're quite big players and also um, uh, people I know because you've been to our thinkings, don't feel coy or shy. Do just put your hand up, I'll come to you. But I do want to make sure that uh, I, I bring in uh, Tim Gordon, because uh, Tim runs Best Practice AI. And I suppose one of the questions that that's sort of bedeviling a lot of people, a lot of us are thinking, is this thing a blip? Is it, a, I appreciate Pippa's point about not hitting the snooze button, but is it the case that we are seeing a fundamental inflection point in the way the economy works? Or is this a hiatus? Is it going to be a gap? And actually more than we expect right now, we're going to go back to, to the way we were. Tim, given the way you sort of think about the application of technology in society and the economy, what's your, I know it's going to be a best guess, but what is your read on the extent to which we are seeing something that's a fundamental change and therefore businesses are going to need to adjust to that? I think first, just worth remembering that if you're a small business, there are three crises you face. The first is you've hit the, the COVID-19 sort of iceberg. And the second is you've got a great recession coming, which is going to massively shift demand and well, basically smash demand in all directions. And third is you've got whatever this new normal is that's going to emerge at the other end. And clearly, a large chunk of this is going to depend on the timing of the crisis and how long it takes for us to get to a place, maybe never, but where we have a vaccine and some sort of medical response. I think what we're seeing, though, is that essentially this is accelerating already a whole bunch of uh, issues of, of, of underlying uh, trends we've seen before. So you're already seeing that, for example, the digital and data-driven societies, companies, are stepping away from those societies and companies that appear less data-driven and less prepared for a digital and virtual world. So whether it's the South Koreans or the Singaporeans versus the Europeans, or whether it's the big platform companies, the Amazons of this world stepping away from traditional retailers, this effect is providing a doubling down on existing trends around sort of returns to data and returns to uh, scale in that space. So I think we're gonna see a lot of that increasingly accelerating away. And you think about how, I, mean, I don't know about you, but I, I feel uncomfortable about the idea of going back in public. So increasingly, it, it, to crowded spaces. So increasingly the virtual world is gonna become more and more important. And if business like Pippers are very well positioned, I think, to really benefit from the trend that's coming down the track. I think they're gonna be careful of a few things. Firstly, a whole bunch of AI company startups at the moment feel a bit like toys. And so there's a whole raft of sort of AI startups that are probably about to face massive cash issues. So we're going to see a, a lot of these companies probably sort of running out of cash in the near future. Now, those people will get other jobs. It's not the end of the world for them. But you can see a lot of those projects may well find themselves drying up. The second issue, concern I've got for the AI industry, at least, is that everyone thinks this is about automation and taking cost out. We'll spend a lot of time focusing on sort of uh, automating often quite small things, whereas in fact the real opportunity here is how you scale business models to a massively greater extent. And finally, for data and AI to work, you need trust. And one of the big things that is at massive risk at the moment is trust, and whether that's how companies treat their people, treat their stakeholders, whether it's how governments treat personal data as we go through and begin to roll out these various testing mechanisms, all of these are going to massively raise the issues around trust. And if we can't get trust sorted, if we don't have people believing in the technology and the data, we face a really real challenge on making this something that works in the future. So for AI, at least, this is a real opportunity in terms of proving it can change the world and make great things happen. But equally, it's in danger of really exacerbating, doubling down with some of those risks that we face in the industry. And, and, and Tim, what do you make of Pippa's point? Uh, I'm going to come to, to Vijay in a moment because he's talking about how you onshore manufacturing. I, I was really struck by her point, and I've succumbed to this, that we've, we've obsessed about software and we've downgraded our interest in hardware. Do you think that that's a fair point and that there is going to be, if you like, a reprioritization of, of value in, in business in the economy? I think there's a, there's a real opportunity here for people who are going to get back into manufacturing in the UK. Uh, the, the, the need for uh, more resilient supply chains, the need to sort of localize things is, is very clear, but it won't be the old style heavy metal bashing. I think the opportunity is going to be around very minimal 3D printing, uh, really localizing of, of, of stuff that's produced and coming up with really higher value by manufacturing and you look at for example i'm sure you've all got you know people are busy sewing away at the moment to sort of produce face masks for people but yeah. what are the opportunities around new style manufacturing when you do have some of these far more uh disaggregated and network communities building things at far greater scale but far more locally whether it's food production 
a whole series of opportunities are probably there to really transform how we produce economic stuff. And, and, and Tim, you know, you, you, you've you been kind enough to sort of come to some of our thinkings and help us with the work around the AI index, you know, the, that my colleague Alexandra Musavizade has pulled together. And one of the things we looked at in the sort of the, uh, the AI index was to try and understand in the global race who were the winners and who were the losers. Uh, and overwhelmingly what you were seeing was the concentration of power in the hands of a few. Although there's going to be a big discussion about resilience and national capacity in the economy, how much do you think that on the AI front, actually that's the, the, what we're going to see is this pandemic re reinforce those trends? You know, we're here on Zoom reliant on their platform. How much are we going to find ourselves being reliant on platforms fundamentally made in very, very few countries, you know, and I'm thinking primarily of the US and China. I think we're at a critical inflection point. So if you're China, where you've got advantages on based on data and some platforms you're building and so on, you're clearly going to step away in terms of the government support is there. If you're the US, the digital platforms are, are, are clearly taking bigger and bigger role in our lives. So Netflix is eating TV, Zoom is eating sort of the hotel and the travel business. There's a whole way in which these platforms are fundamentally transforming the world. I think for Europe, what we've had in the past in AI and the, and the index that, that you guys have put together really brings us out is a huge volume of skills and insight and sort of very smart people who can do all sorts of clever things in Europe. What we've kind of lacked is we've lacked a mission. We've lacked a sense of what we're doing with it. Mm. So the US has a very clear mission, which is dominate the world with its digital platforms. China has a very clear mission, which is use AI to basically give the government the ability to control society at very deep levels. What's Europe's mission been? What's our moonshot yeah. been? And to some extent, COVID-19, with some of the immediate applications, you can begin to see some of those mission opportunities. So the work that the NHSX did around sort of building data platforms to really begin to work out supply and demand inside the NHS for ventilators and emergency staff and so on, is actually the sort of thing the NHS should have been doing ages ago. It's able to use the crisis to really accelerate into that. And one thing we're seeing with small businesses as well is that in hard times, hard decisions become easier. And so one of the hard decisions they had to make was to build that digital platform. Now, that in itself is probably just proof of concept level, but it begins to give us a sense of Europe could take this, could turn it into a real defining opportunity moment, where we say, we're going to use this to transform the environment, we're going to use this to transform society, and go for it. Whether we will is another question. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's really interesting. Th thank you. I'm, I'm going to pick up on your, your point about manufacturing and these, and these software platforms. I was really struck the fact that Hugh, Hugh's comment was localization of parts of manufacturing is going to be a big theme, but will tech globalization get accelerated? Everyone needs cloud and they're going to be five big global players. The winners take most remains a big theme. It seems to me that is probably not what people are saying, but it's going to be what's happening. Um, in that spirit, I was just going to come to Vijay if I could. Uh, um, uh, hello there, Vijay. I, I, I'm struck by your point about saying onshoring of manufacturing. Can you just explain why you think onshoring of manufacturing is going to be a means for governments to get themselves out of the situation they're in? Well, I think, James, we're going to come out of this crisis with, with huge, huge levels of, of unemployment. Um, and I can't really see a way for for government to um, reinvigorate some of the businesses that we um, we will have not not some of those we will have lost but also I think some will have issues of, of capacity so for example if I think about um, professional services for example I think there will be professional services consultants and that for many organizations is discretionary spend so I can't see businesses who would have been consuming those services necessarily accelerating that spend in a short period of time. And I think if government is to get the economy back to uh, a state where we have a reasonable level of consumer demand again, you're going to need to create jobs, uh, put money back into people's pockets. Um, it, it feels like the US and China are on the cusp of a trade war. That trade war may well involve tariffs. Um, it may make Chinese goods much, much more expensive. Um, and that may give the government in the US and the UK and more broadly in Europe opportunities to start bringing some manufacturing back. I think in the chat, people have noted that it's very difficult to make clothing um, profitably in, in, in higher, higher wage economies. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it's not things as simple as as clothing but you know we're, we're talking about things like additive manufacturing 
you know, it's maybe it's it's digital printing, it's it's those newer technologies. Yeah. And by, by accelerating the growth of those manufacturing capabilities, it, it's perhaps a way to create a, a bit of wage inflation and put a bit of growth back into the economy. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, VJ. Um, I noticed uh, Pippa's point that it may be a war, not a trade war. Uh, Pippa, for what it's worth, the one thing we've begun to look into is this extraordinary exchange of uh, allegations around Wuhan labs and the 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 the, the risk of uh, fear and recrimination. Um, but I'm going to come back uh, if I can. Uh, and thank you, VJ, for that point. But I'm going to come back if I can to Mike uh, Lynch. Mike, I'd. I suppose I, I, I wanted to actually give ourselves a chance to say, okay, let, let's step back. Let's say you, you've, you've, you've done your hungry wolf thing. You've worked out the way in which you're going to make sure you minimize your, your costs and you're going to survive the winter. But you're also there as a business saying, you know, to Tim's point, the world is going to change in some really fundamental ways. If we can reorient ourselves to, to make the most of it, the opportunities are amazing. And so one, how do you plan for that, given uncertainty around revenues? And will you just sort of follow up on Pippa's point about investor cash, how much is available and how much isn't? So can you just sort of answer the point about how you thrive um, uh, and how you make the most of this moment? How can I do that round the other way? So the reality is that we're going to go for a period where there is going to be almost no investor cash. Hold on, Mike, you're going to have to speak up because I couldn't quite hear you. Sorry, we're going to go for a period where there's going to be almost no investor cash. So what you've got, for example, the VCs is generally an overreaction to the negative. They're asking portfolio companies to fire lots of people. The individual partners are getting margin calls. And of course, they've got the mark to market problems with their own portfolios. So what you actually see in this situation, and it's well documented, is that you, you see a, an increase of funding leading up to an event like this. And then when an event like this happens, the funding um, crashes. But the fascinating thing is that the best returns are always from investments done in the, um, the crash period. The vintage returns are best when people start investing now. So what you're going to see is a series of changes which businesses can look to take advantage of. First of all, there's the changes in the economy which were happening anyway, but now will accelerate. So the obvious case of this would be um, high street retail versus e-commerce. You know, the question wasn't really if, it was when, and when is going to happen a lot quicker now in that situation. For the high growth technology businesses, um, when you just come from a period like we have, a lot of things got funded that shouldn't have got funded. And that's always the way, and those things disappear. And uh, you know, one of the great things to do if you're running one of those is to be honest with yourself and now is the time to either do a big pivot or to, uh, to, to, to fold up and come up with another idea. What that means is that suddenly the amount of money that's being poured into PR, advertising, um, that all massively reduces, therefore you can get above the noise. Um, you've got the ability to take over the business need that was being served by a failed model. Um, you've got the ability to hire great people. And there will be some very good investors still there that will um, invest and, and, and give cash. And so what actually happens in this period when you look at it is that the companies that go into it good do come out um, as actually moving up a whole level of greatness. So for example, you know, I've seen companies where they set themselves up, they were doing things for litigation management. You get a situation like this, you come out the other side and those companies can become very, very big, very quickly. The competition uh, falls away. And yes, the wall of money that Pippa's talking about will build up and it will arrive, but actually it arrives far too late um, because by the time that money starts, you're back in that cycle of very large amounts of investment, um, which actually don't uh, deliver the same returns as the smaller amounts that happen in the downturn. So what you've got to be looking at is saying, once I get through my survival, what is it I want to own? What is it I want to still be there um, in the uh, recovery and then the growth period? So you need to look at the activities that are actually going to happen. And obviously, this is the magic decision. You know, the ones I've done in the past were realizing that on the other side of this, people are going to sue each other. So that turned out to be a great investment. It was very difficult during the period 
of the downturn, but afterwards when everyone was clearing up the mess, um, those, those were great businesses. So what is it people are going to do? And they're not going to be doing the blue skies, um, amazing, great idea stuff for a while. Um, investors are going to want to see something which can generate cash in the not too distant future. So what you've got to do with the investors that you've got is manage them in the short term to stop them overreacting. Mm -hmm. The worst thing to do with an investor is to tell them you've got it all covered and there's going to be no problem. You have to tell them that you've acknowledged um, that you're entering this survival plan for a while. But on the other hand, protect the assets that the business has, for example, the people. And then look at areas where um, the acceleration of the change in business models is actually going to throw up um, an advantage. And look at what the economy will look like in the period that goes from survival mode through recovery. The activities that take off, they take off in different phases. Certain things happen first and certain things will be a long way off. So for example, if you had a business that was I don't know, very interested in um, very big long-term AI and fundamental AI, it might be very important to find an application now, uh, which is one where people just have to do it because that's what will get you through that period. By the time the wave of money comes back, you'll have either won or lost. So don't rely on waiting for that situation. Um, I think it is a great time of opportunity. When you look back, Although you know, 80 to 90%, for example, of the startups tend to disappear through this period, um, the ones that survive do go on to be um, really good companies uh, because not only have they locked in on what the customer needs, um, but they've got their operations organized. And if you're not able to actually be talking to a customer through this period, yeah. then you've got a problem. Customers will remember uh, what you did for them during this time. Uh, and those are the people that they will remember when things get better. So looking after that, that relationship with the customers is absolutely crucial. I think the other thing about the investors is um, the government investors will find it very difficult for people like the British Business Bank to actually work out what is the right thing to invest in and what isn't. Um, but the distorting effect of money going to businesses that ought to be allowed to die, because the amount of money is actually relatively small, uh, will still be dwarfed by this effect of the advantage to the good businesses of a lot of the noise disappearing. Um, it is quite incredible when you look at things like advertising and PR rates um, through a period like this, where they go from being incredibly expensive because all that VC money is being spent on those sort of things uh, to being incredibly cheap. And that's when companies can actually um, make themselves well-known names and rise above the noise. So it is the period where you create the real companies. Um, it just requires understanding that you have to survive to get to the other side first. Well, Mike, th th thank, thank you for that. I, I, I want to um, I, I want to just come, if I could, to Angus Gillen, because I'd like to... Th th there's a point that that Angus was just making about our experience. Hello, Angus. A, a, a point that, that you were making about our experience in the financial crash and who wins and who loses, it picks up, I suppose, on Pippa's kind of 1920s Gatsby point. Um, and I, I, I'd like you to make it, because I want to come back to Hugh and Pippa in particular around, and, and Tim too, actually, about policy. What do you do to try and deal with it? So, so do you want to sort of weigh in? Um, so the question was just, um thought of an Atlantic article that was written recently called Generation C has nowhere to turn and it's just analyzing that from 2008 onwards those who were in their early to mid 20s during 2008 now are uh, less likely to be homeowners uh, there's fewer marriages in that demographic and there's fewer families as well so as we move forward with economic recovery how can we ensure that there's a kind of positive healthy civic society and uh, social growth at the same time as economic recovery um, so that people aren't left behind and we have you know, strong families, strong communities. Uh, th Angus, thank you. And Hugh, can I, can I put that to you and actually try and ask you to do something which is even more difficult than answering that particular issue, um, which is to think about with your sort of former public policy hat on, how do you make sure that the response and the answer in this recession doesn't exacerbate the inequalities in 
that were that were created in the last in in a follow up to the financial crisis, but also just picking up on Mike's point about the impact on investment. What happens now to the valuation of companies and then that element of the market that pulls businesses together, makes businesses go bust? The, 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 the collapse of potential investment will presumably have a big impact on valuations and that will have a knock-on effect too in the way companies operate and are formed. So we just, as we've only got sort of eight minutes left, I've left, I just wanted to put both of those things to you and then I'll come to Pippa in a second. Uh, well, look, yeah, t two enormous questions. I mean, so the first and foremost, and I think as a, as a great point about the, the impact on generation, is to try and minimise the scarring impact. And so I think a lot of the programmes, not just in the UK, but across the world have been, you know, preserve jobs, preserve small businesses, preserve medium to large size businesses. So, you know, some will fail, but to make sure as, as, as much of the economy is there as we move into the, re the restart of the economy. And I think one of the big challenges, and I think where maybe the UK government has at times got it wrong, is, um, you know, how it, it's almost uh, at the point that uh, Pippa made about resilience versus efficiency. Don't be so focused on efficiency that you miss the bigger picture. And so some of these initial programmes were so focused on not wanting to, to lose money that they didn't go broad and deep enough. And I think this, the fact that over, overnight over 100,000 businesses applied for loans speaks to the fact you need to go broad rather than just efficient. But, mm -hmm. you know, there will be, as, as we've all said, significant failures. So uh, as, as we work through this at different speeds, uh, but I think it's, it's being broad uh, and then also being very thoughtful about what is the roadmap out of this and then try and give people vision. Because I don't know, take an example. Let's imagine that we all need to wear masks on and off for the next 18 months on the tube, in lifts, what have you. Why isn't the government saying this is where we're going? Therefore, we need to unlock strategic capacity so people are starting to produce these. And until you provide that strategic capacity, you know, it's going to take longer to re reopen. And I think what a lot of individual businesses doing are trying to sort of second guess that and actually do the right thing for their staff and employees and, 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 and so, so staff and, and counterparts. So I think there's a kind of thinking big picture about what really is critical to unlock and then just let, let the private sector get on with it. So, so I think that there's, a, that there's a lot of issues around policy. Just very quickly on your question about investors. Well, look, uh, I think I'm with Mike and Pippa on this, that whilst there's a lot of money swilling around, uh, probably more folk are probably thinking about where are their weak hands? Can I pick up a great business at a cheap price because someone else is a for seller rather than I'm going to go out and make a ton of new investments? And so I think, uh, I, think I know the fintech sector well. I can, I was on a, I've been on calls the last few weeks, uh, not just in the UK, but around the world, talking about a decimation of this ecosystem. Now, that's probably a little bit too fanciful, but I think there's going to be a very significant shakeup. And thinking certainly about advising a small business, you need to be very cognizant of who are your partners, who are your customers, who are suppliers, because some of them won't make it through. And I think that's going to also be very challenging. So you need to almost, in your scenario planning, thinking through who would we use if it, such and such a partner wasn't there in the future? Yeah. Okay. Hugh, thank you. Um, Pippa, can I come to you, come to you on, on both of those things, um, but particularly the sort of bigger public policy point, how do you make sure that this, that this doesn't end up with a 1920 scenario you're, you're suggesting? I, well, I think there are a number of things that we've got to pay attention to now. Um, one is central banks, you know, traditionally are focused on price stability as opposed to focused on keeping the economy in good shape. And we've shifted towards, we'll do anything to keep the economy going at the expense of price stability potentially. And so I think there's a risk here that we could see inflation begin to bubble up in the next few years. That's a highly controversial thing to say because most people think we're in such a deflationary downdraft, how is that possible? But inflation expectations are a psychological phenomena and people have now experienced that they'd be willing to pay a pound for an egg or a fiber for a loaf of bread because they have actually lived through a shortage now, even if it was temporary. And um, the, the lack of supply will put upward pressures on prices at some point. Uh, so that's one thing. I think a bigger issue is what we're all talking about is these individual businesses exist in the context of a very broad social contract. And the social contract has been broken heavily, not just by COVID, but again, by the exposure of the pre-existing conditions. 
pension funds are in terrible shape. It's the story is blown. And, and one way to think about it is the debt burden that now has been massively expanded by these events is like a wrecking ball that literally bears down on the social fabric, which is made up of the promises that hold our society together. Like, you know, if you work hard, you'll get a pension when you're 65. And now the story is going to be, well, maybe when you're 85, you're going to get the pension or maybe never. Now, this breaking of the social contract makes it very difficult for businesses to decide what they're going to do because they can't depend on what's that fundamental structure of glue that holds the society together. This is a big subject really for another discussion, but it's very crucial to understand. For example, there are other victims of COVID, like we've lost habeas corpus. Yeah. There's no privacy. Google and Apple are sharing your location finder data because they're trying to fix the COVID, but will governments use that location finder data in ways that disrupt the usual balance of power between citizens and states? These are profound questions. They are, Pippa, and happily, we're going to run a series of thinkings called How We Live Next, and one of them is going to be particularly discussing that technology thing, uh, that te technology set of questions. Um, just, I'm going to come finally just back to uh, Tim Gordon, if I might, and Tim, w would you address, because, you know, in a previous life, obviously, you played a big part in the politics of the Lib Dems, um, the, the issues that, uh, that, that Angus was mentioning that we just spent the last five minutes talking about are about how government can feasibly step in. What would you be advising uh, if there was a way of trying to minimise the acceleration or the unevenness uh, of, the un of unfairness as a result of this? I think part of the challenge here is we don't yet know what that uh, impact is going to be. So uh, I saw some, some, something in the comments about how London tech firms can do better than everywhere else. Actually, London's role is a big melting pot, and probably no one wants to go to a big melting pot where the real economy is around meeting restaurants and cafes and so on, uh, and that may well shift away. I think the big concern I've got at the moment is that the government is doing a lot of very good things, I think, to try and freeze the world as it was. The problem is the world is not going to be as it was, and we're moving to a new world, which probably is a less uh, robust one, less rich one, less, uh, in some ways less hallison one than the ones we've been through for the past uh, couple of decades. It's a world where China's going to become more powerful. It's a world where economic growth is going to be potentially massively slowed. And I think we need to be planning and thinking and have a real vision for what the country could be at the end of that. And it's going to be stuff around data. It's going to be around technology. But it's really going to be how we plan ahead. And we really, to Mike's point, do the same thing with a country as we might do with a company, which is work out what is it we need to save to really prosper in the new age. And the moment we're still very focused on how we return to an old world that frankly wasn't good enough. Okay, Tim, thank you very much. Um, Michael, that's an, a, a fascinating and, and sort of thought-provoking start to the day. Thank you all for coming. If you've been to a thinking before, you know that the sort of job of the editor at the end is to try and say, all right, where does that propel our journalism? What are the points that we take away and how's our thinking been informed by the conversation? I have to say that I, I come away actually with with three really strong impressions um, and I'll just sort of run through them very quickly. One is it, we're going into the winter. And, you know, Mike's point that you have to survive, that the, the hungry wolf eats whatever scraps possible, um, that you shouldn't allow, if you're a small business or you're a startup, your, you know, predisposition to optimism to get the better of you, you know, and we just keep kept hearing similar things, you know, Hugh's point about de decimation in the fintech sector, uh, you know, the contraction investment funds in the short term, what that will do to valuations as a result of it. Um, I saw Daniel Dolph Steinberg made a point about how that would crash valuations. Um, I'm really struck by the fact that we think we're dealing with a liquidity problem, but for a lot of businesses, it's fundamental solvency. Is it a viable business? And I thought there was an interesting point in the chat just towards the end there from Ollie Bone saying, just think about what the impact is for workers when there is very high level of unemployment actually your rights and your power to keep your job is much diminished so i think that's let's not take away if we take away one thing let's take away the fact that we've got a scale of economic problem and pain here which is really significant i think the other thing to is to do is is to sort of take to heart the point that mike was making that you know vintage investments get made now because you call out big changes in behavior and whether it's pippa's point about 
cloud clubbing or Mike's point about how people sue each other um, or do sue each other, a shift uh, to more investment in hardware rather than just software, localization of manufacturing, or alternatively, the consolidation of power amongst global tech players. All of that seems to me to be a read on how behavior changes and the impact on the economy and business. And then the th third and final area, which I suppose are the ones that should propel us to have a look journalistically, are, are our sense that we've got some really significant public policy problems. And as so far, the government has not been nimble enough in dealing with them. So I really take to heart the point that Hugh made at the top about drawing the lesson of the fact that you know, so many companies have stepped in for these bounce back loans. It seems to me there's a really significant issue now about future funding, the next wave of public and uh, government support uh, into the economy. The fundamental problem that Pippa and Hugh made about banks as the vehicle for distributing that kind of distributing that kind of support. And we'll look Pippa into the question of a resolution trust court. It's a really complicated undertaking for exactly the reason uh, you suggested. Um, and I'm also really interested by the sort of scale of ambition that Tim laid out about the idea of a European mission. What's actually the place of Europe in this tech, uh, tech world? Um, most of all, though, I just want to say I really appreciate the chance to listen to all of you think through in quite such a practical way how you make sure that you do both of the things that Mike set out, I think, in, in, in both uh, halves of the conversation, first survive and then make sure that you're really focused on the opportunities to thrive. Uh, thank you. Most of the time, our thinkings veer wildly off course. This one miraculously has really addressed the question at hand. So a huge thank you to you, Mike, Tim, Pippa, Hugh and everyone who's joined in this morning. Uh, I hope it's been uh, useful. Uh, thanks for sparing your time and have a very good day. Uh, do wave yourselves a happy day and a uh, a good day. Thanks so much. Bye.